But early in 1951, the Eighth Army stopped the communist offensive. General Matthew Ridgway, now commanding the forces ashore, orders Operation Killer, destruction of enemy troops and equipment wherever found. At the front, along the North Korean coastline, and far behind the front. Aviation plays an important role in Operation Killer. To Navy, Marine, and Air Force squadrons goes the important job of wrecking enemy lines of communications by attacks on rail yards, bridges, transportation facilities, and equipment. Orders go out to the 5th Air Force and Task Force 77. Prevent the flow of troops and supplies to the front. Interdict, strangle. Aircraft carriers are especially suited to the coordinated air interdiction program. With United Nations Naval Forces in command of the sea, these mobile air bases can operate far to the rear of the enemy. From the exposed communist flank in the Sea of Japan, carrier aircraft are able to strike strategic targets in Northeast Korea, targets far out of range of shore-based fighters. Over the next two years, Operation Strangle becomes a primary objective of carrier operations. The plan is ingenious. Cut the bridges, cut tracks, close tunnels, hit rail marshalling yards, force the enemy out on the highways, shoot up his road traffic, force him to move at night, then lash out with night fighters, make life miserable for the communists, interdict, strangle, night and day. For carrier men, interdiction is an around-the-clock proposition, day in, day out, month in, month out. Flight quarters, fuel planes, arm planes, spot planes, launch planes, fast fleet fighters, harbingers of the jet age, Panther, Banshee, fighter bombers, piston veterans of World War II, the Corsair, back at the familiar job, and hard-hitting dive bombers, AD Sky Raiders, carrying deadly loads into the West. There's no rest for the carrier sailor even those who wait. As the months of war drag by, carrier-based planes flying from ships in the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea play an important role in the United Nations drive back north. They fly close air support missions in coordination with Air Force and Army units. But their big job is still interdiction, bridge busting, rail breaking, tunnel blasting. These become routine. The means of accomplishing interdiction are varied, some unusual. As in April 1951, when the communists launched their ill-fated spring offensive, United Nations troops dig in behind the Pukan River, waiting for the attack. But the Reds have a plan. They close the gates of the Huachan Reservoir, hoping in this way to lower the river's level so they can press their attack across the Pukan against the Allied defenders. But the communists don't figure on the Princeton and her dive-bombing Sky Raiders. For the first time since World War II, torpedoes are combat-loaded on the big bombers. These planes fly far inland to the Wachon Reservoir, swooping down at treetop level to launch their torpedoes. All direct hits, reservoir floodgates open with great geysers of concrete and water. The Pukan River floods. The communists wait. Advantage lost. A year later, a spectacular interdiction operation. This time, carrier planes team up with shore-based Marines and the 5th Air Force. The target, communist power plants near the Yalu River. On two days in June 1952, carrier planes mount a total of 556 bombing sorties. While Sabre jets fly high cover on the lookout for MiGs, naval planes sweep in to deliver their deadly loads. 90% of North Korea's entire power potential is knocked out. For Navy and Air Force, these are the largest raids since World War II. Carrier aviation has other jobs to perform in support of the United Nations effort, spotting for naval gunfire, working closely with the fleet. Airborne eyes train seaborne artillery on coastal targets. Photographic reconnaissance is still another carrier job. Daring photo planes fly low over heavily defended positions to bring back information for tomorrow's strike. Other planes, other ships, keep the carrier fighting. Cargo carriers, like this converted TBM torpedo bomber, bring in mail, spare parts, passengers on regularly scheduled runs. 
Cod Airlines, sailors call these lumbering planes. Supplies must also come from the sea. Ammunition from ships in the Mobile Logistic Support Force. Oil and gasoline from fleet tankers. Dry and refrigerated stores from attack cargo ships. Floating supermarkets. Everything from soup to nuts. The task force is built around the carrier. Screening destroyers receive fuel, news, and spiritual comfort from the floating city it protects. Buffeted by angry waves, racing ahead, behind, on all sides of the carrier, the destroyer is an ever-present, tireless sentinel, and though the carrier sailor might take its presence for granted, he would feel mighty uncomfortable if he knew the cans were not close at hand. This is the carrier, its men, its claims, and its record in the Korean War, a record that speaks of itself. From late 1950 through 1953, the United States Navy maintained continuously on station in the Far East a hard-hitting carrier force, independent of Korean land bases, sustained by the Mobile Logistic Support Force at sea, free to move at will to points far behind enemy lines, this force reaped the dividends which come from command of the sea. Here is what naval aviation accomplished in Korea. Over 1,119 days of sustained combat operations, Navy and Marine squadrons launched a total of 183,000 aircraft. These planes, from piston corsairs to sleek sky knights, flew more than one-third of all the combat sorties flown by the United States during the Korean War. On strikes against the enemy, carrier-based aircraft delivered more tons of high explosives than carrier planes dropped in all of World War II. Today, these veteran carriers and the men who fight them stand ready to help United States naval air power strike against any future aggression anywhere in the world.